what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. Desecrated. God told us that the number one enemy to your intimacy is not Satan. It's the world and mammon. The world and mammon. So the apostles were skilled in scriptures. So it was not difficult, difficult for them to discern between right and wrong. They knew the word. The second level of discernment is the discernment between good and evil. So the first level is right and wrong. And for you to know right and wrong, there must be a moral compass. You must know that compass. But the next level is good and evil. While right and wrong is word test, good and evil is a spirit test. So there's a spirit of good and there's a spirit of evil. So the Bible will tell us that we should test all spirits so that we will know the ones that are of God. When it comes to spirit test, the way you facilitate a spirit test is that you must be familiar with the Holy Spirit. If you've not deepened yourself in your relationship with the Holy Ghost, a strange spirit can be prophesying and you will not know. If you have the spirit of God and you dwell in that environment regularly, if you sit in a place and the man is saying the right things, the question, what your spirit is checking is by which spirit is he saying it? I've listened to a guy who talks against immorality, but if we do not know what is happening behind, you don't know some of the things we know. You hear him talking, he's talking against immorality, but we know him. Is a perpetual fornicator, but he still moves in the gifts of the spirit. Is a perpetual fornicator. So when men like us listen, we are conducting a spirit test. By what spirit? Remember, there was a young lady that was prophesying after Paul. These men are servants of God, and they have come to show us the way of salvation. My God, that's a powerful prophecy, man of God. Eh? Imagine you enter into a village to do crusade as you just enter. The number one witch doctor just begins to prophesy. He's here by the power of God to save us from all the demons. You'll say, even demons prophesy about my grace. I assure you, he will cut that portion. He will turn it into a one-minute reel and put it on YouTube. And the, the way young men do it now is not as, I'm not trying to brag. But I just want to show you dimensions of grace. Even demons prophesy about my calling. Coming soon, a kitty village. Omolokova. Ziva Tome. Ah! Paul ignored it. Then the Bible says he became uneasy. It means he was conducting a test. The words were correct, but the question is by which spirit? Is the second level of discernment. The third level of discernment is the ability to discern between good and God. The ability to discern between good and God is the highest level of discernment. In, at this level, what you are contending against is not evil. The matters at this level is your ability to discern what the will of the Lord is. So the Bible we say in Hebrews chapter 5 that solid food belonged to them who through use have trained themselves to be able to discern between good and evil. So it means that from the spirit test upward, there is a need to be able to train your senses. If your senses are not trained in the school of the spirit, oh swallow your pride tonight, come to the school of the spirit. Don't you know in his hands are the keys of eternal life. A little here, a little there, till the day will dawn in you, bringing everything in obedience to Christ. Oh, he's the whole Holy Ghost, Spirit of the living God. He's the Holy Ghost, he's the whole 
Holy Ghost, scepter of the King of Kings. He's the Holy Ghost. He's the ho Holy Ghost, Spirit of the Age to Come. Yeah, bringing everything in obedience. There is a need to train. And in this training, you must be willing to discipline yourself. Swallow your pride. Come to the school of the spirit. And learn the ways of God. If not, you will not be able to differentiate between good and God. For instance, now you are looking for a job. And then you get two offers. One to teach in Anticaro group of schools. And the other one with ND Western. Anticaro, they are even negotiating 45,000 with you. ND Western, only the offer letter. You have died multiple times. I assure you, as you are sitting there, you already know what the will of God is. You don't need any preacher. Say, how, how can God give me teaching and give me oil? And you say, I should take teaching. That devil is a liar. Many will not even pray. God never see how I suffer. I have been suffering. And now God has opened the door. Then this preacher with gray hair, he just likes people suffering. Man of God, take your grace somewhere else. <laughs> Meanwhile, when God was designing you in eternity, he had prepared you to be a functionary in the educational sector. He wants to use you to liberate young people from darkness, sin and death. But because you have not trained your spirit to discern between good and God, you are about to make a mistake that will cost you your place in destiny. That's how many good brothers are in bad marriages. Sometimes I'll be counseling women, and in my heart I'll be saying, how did she get here? One of them like that I was talking to, I had to ask her, because now that I had met her, the way she was, I said, this thing cannot be a mistake. And then I said, how did you get here? Tears broke from her eyes. She said, God told me from day one. From day one, she knew. But her heart had fallen in love with an abomination. Because man of God, I have found out that you can't change certain things in the spirit. The way to life, the Bible says, it is narrow. And it is difficult. This thing that we want, that we want everything to be easy, is why many people's discernment is low. Am I saying God can't give you ND Western or Chevron or Shell? If it is the will of God, it's okay. But if you don't know how to discern the will of God, may you not find yourself in the congregation of ghosts. Yeah. Then after 30 years, you now realize that you were living, but you were wasting. There's nothing wrong with wasting if you are wasting in the hand of God. But don't waste in Satan's hand. Satan will waste men and destroy them. God wastes you and brings you to glory. He says, vessels unto honor is that after they have been used, he honors them. It's the highest level of discernment. And I'm, I said all of this to say to you that the major challenge we have that Christians are not operating dynamically like the apostles, like the disciples of old, like men like Ananias. Sure you know if it were today, people would be asking, how do I know it's the voice of God speaking? Somebody that is killing Christians. Somebody that has letters. Are you sure it's not the devil? Let me call my pastor. Rev, oh, Rev, it's an emergency at 12 a.m. He called, he doesn't speak. He will call you 14 times at 12 a.m. One called me recently. I was in the thick of so many things at the same time. Calling, 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 calling. Almost seven missed calls. I said, wait till they happen. So I sent a text. Who is this? I can't take your call now. He said, it's a matter. The, the text message, I was reading it in his voice. It's a matter of life and death. <laughs> it's an emergency. He sent one, sent the other one. And now I, I know these people. So I said, what is the emergency? I should leave everything I'm doing and answer you now. What is the emergency? Then he sent me a dream that he had. <laughs> you don't know what we go through. And said, what do 
I do now, sir? That's the emergency. I should leave everything. So even if me and my wife, I was in the hospital or something tending to my family, I had a critical matter, I should dump it because you dreamed. The reason we have made pastors our support structure that we cannot hear God for ourselves is because what we have been fed has been designed to keep us as perpetual babes. Perpetual babes. One woman, years ago, I was still in a denomination. Her cry was that she's leaving the church. She's not serving God again. Until what happened? See, her child was dying in her hands. She called all the pastors she knew. Nobody picked. So she's leaving the church. Did you read in Hebrews that women received their dead? Back to that. Now what our mothers do is teach our daughters how to cook soup. How to be a good wife. How to cut, cut work. You go to some inter-house sports and you see seven-year-olds looking like scarecrows. The mother has given her eyelashes that is like a broom. The shoe that the girl is walking, she can't walk where she's walking like She's struggling to catwalk. The mother is projecting her lust on her small daughter. Because she knows she's too old. If she wears mini skirt, they will put her in prison. So she projects the lust on her child. You are looking at a seven-year-old and you are wondering, what, what is this? What is this? Who did this? In those days, women... They were dangerous intercessors. Why do you think it's in the Bible? Dangerous. They knew how to receive their dead. Back to life. An evangelist gave birth to four children. All four daughters were prophets. They prophesied. For it to be acknowledged in scriptures that they were prophets means that there was something about those ladies that if you came into their environment, you will know you have come into the environment of God. I was studying hymn writers one season in my life because I began to get tired of the songs we were singing in church. Carry me, they go. They over carry me. I began to get tired. Somebody sat down, didn't see anything to sing about his money come, money come, money, money, money come. I got tired. In those days, I got tired. So I began to study hymn writers and I stumbled upon the woman called Frances Havigar. The woman that wrote, take my life and let it be. The biographers told us that if have a girl walked into your room, you could sense the presence of the Holy Spirit like a man. Like a man. What did these women find? Nowadays, we want to relegate the women to the background that a woman is just to know how to cook beggary and, and make a mala. Meanwhile, if you have a good woman that knows the way of the Spirit in your life. Man of God, God just reminded me when you were singing. When you were leading. I don't know what it is about relationship. Eh? But may God give you seeing eyes. <laughs> man of God, sit on this man. Oh. May God give you seeing eyes. What I saw in the spirit when you were leading was a strange lady standing by your side. Strange lady. Standing by your side. By your side. And the Lord said, tell him. If he makes a mistake there, he's finished. That's what I heard. Sorry. That's what I heard. He's finished. Because you see me, I don't listen to people sing with my ear. I listen with my spirit. There's something on your voice. If you stay with God. If you stay with God. A woman. One of my blessings in life is my wife. My wife. A mighty blessing. Mighty blessing. Not boisterous. She's not crazy about, about being on poster. They wanted to do sister's program. I said they must put your picture there. They, mu they must put it there. They must put your picture. She doesn't even want to see her picture on the flyer. Her major goal is that the one that God gave me as husband, let him fulfill his calling. My children, let me raise them in the fear of the Lord. Then the young people that God brings around me, let me have grace to mentor them. That's an uncle. I'm not saying every woman must be like that. The problem with many young men now that they have not married to now is that anytime they think about their calling, they are checking whether the sister can fit poster. Hmm. 
You say, you get the kind wife where you they marry for ministry. So when I do like this, then she'll do like this. Mandavati. Lubre Suvana. So anyone that does not have good chin to hold, he say, no, this one is not from Jesus. Because he has already seen that she must do like this. So he's approaching 40. Eh? He can't hear God about marriage because there's another lust in his soul that is of the devil. God say, marry that sister. He says, see her kobo leg. Her leg has been cobbled for your destiny. The reason she has kobo leg is to be able to cobble your destiny. It's part of your, it's part of your calling. Those of you following online, kobo leg, I don't know how to describe it in English. The problem is you don't know the difference between good and God. You see, I've counseled many people. One of the loneliest places to be is in a wrong marriage. Hmm. And because you know God, you know divorce is not allowed. You'll now be bearing. I've seen good men, good women. Everything about God ended the day they married. When I went to youth service, I served with missionaries on the field. When I got to my location... I volunteer. That's how they used to recruit. They will come to NYC camp. They will show you what is happening on the mission field. Then you write your name. They will now send your name to NYC and say that you have volunteered. NYC will now post you to them. They had mission schools on the mountain. But it was not school that was making them take you there majorly. They were taking you there as a missionary to labor. So NYC will post you to their missionary school so that you can go and labor with them. I served as a missionary. When we got there, the people who brought us there told us a story of a man. He was a sweet missionary. He was two sets before my set. A copper, a core member, NYC guy. He got there, he was laboring. They saw that his calling was missions. So when he finished youth service, he didn't go back. He stayed. He knew he was in the center of his calling. Many of the work that had been done on the field were done by him. Committed missionary. And then he fell in love. The day he brought his sister to see the reverend, the man looked at the sister and called the brother away quietly and said, Oh, God, you can't marry this lady. Oh. But have you seen pointed nose? There's a kind of pointed nose. Oh, le It can confuse you. You know when we used to do debate in those days, say, I, I'm here I not to confuse you, but to convince you. Ah, nose. Heaps. When Satan knows that anytime you see a dark-colored sister or a dark-colored brother, you lose your senses. He will, he will package a serpent. Our own darkness or his own darkness will not even be the normal dark. It will be like chocolate. When you hear sisters talking about TDH, tall, dark, and handsome, he's a killer. Hmm? The man of God looked at his sister and said, Ah, Oga, don't marry this sister. He didn't listen. He married her. Some months into her stay, she says, I can't stay here. This place is not my calling. I can't do this thing with you. I'm talking about a field where in one of the locations, the water that we drink, the frogs are jumping inside. It's brown. There's a lady that was with us. She was one set ahead of mine. She's in the US with her family now. The only way she could drink that water is that she would fetch it and put milk inside. She will now psych her mind that she's drinking tea. That was the only way she could drink the water. I'm saying frogs. You are fetching water. I'm seeing frogs jumping inside. I went to go and visit a family once to do follow-up because I was leading the missionary church. I got to that village. Then they brought food. My God. Me, normally, I don't like... Uh, how do you say draw soup in English? Huh? Soup that's drawing. <laughs> Slimy soup. I don't like because when we when as a young man we used to suffer. So one one of the easiest soups that they used to cook is okra ogbono. So I hate it. In fact, it's my wife that introduced me into trying to love that soup again. Because my wife is a dangerous cook. Ome lokodo. So I got there. It's not that the soup was drawing alone. It was black and flies were flying everywhere. Black draw soup. <laughs> Jesus. They now served me with a cup of water and sat down. 
Not go and eat it in your house. Shop and more, we say. Shop and <laughs> I'm a trained missionary. I spoke in tongues. Lobre Kuvana. What I was telling God is, please let it pass my truth. Please let it pass. Because I know my belly can reject it. Then you vomit in front of the people you came to evangelize. So I put it. As I did it like this, I said, hey, Jesus. I swallowed one. So I know it's not my stomach. God created his stomach in the spirit. I'm not sure that thing stayed in my stomach. It was just going. That's the kind of place I'm talking about. The lady said, I can't stay. One day he went to go and follow up on people. Before he came, she had packed her things, carried everything she had, and gone back to the city. And she told him in black and white, if you still want this marriage, leave that mission field. The man told us he wept, 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 and he told him, you have married, oh. go and meet your wife. May marriage not uproot you from destiny. It has capacity to uproot men from destiny. From destiny. We must begin to fight for accurate teaching again. Just show men Jesus. When they know him truly, then they will love him utterly. And when they love him utterly, then they will obey him absolutely. If they obey him absolutely, then they will be witnesses unto him faithfully. That's the journey of every true believer. You know him? When you see him as it is, he is, you love him. The Bible says, I think it is 37 now, that after Acts chapter 2, 37, that after Peter preached, these men were caught to the heart. What did he say? You killed Jesus. He died. Now he's resurrected. God has made him who you killed governor of the whole world and your Messiah. And he dawned on them. So our hope appeared to us and we killed our own hope with our own hand. And the Bible says they were caught to the heart and they asked a simple question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent. And be baptized unto the remission of sin. And you and your household shall be saved. And you shall receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is not unto you only. But is unto you and your generations. And to all them that we believe. So even in the first message that was preached. You were captured. In the first message that was preached. Peter implicated you in the revival. He said that same thing that you were prophesied. That men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Sons and daughters will prophesy. After the outpouring of the spirit. He said even to as many that we believe. They are implicated in that prophecy. And the Bible says 3,000. 3,000. Were added to the church. 3,000. A simple message. You see what God wants to do to us this afternoon? Is that as we pray, that outpouring, so that you will know him. Bro, the Holy Ghost has a way of introducing the living Christ to you. The Holy Ghost is our greatest resource. We can't do anything with him without him. He's our greatest resource. Greatest resource. David said, by you, I, I go against a troop. I leap over a wall. There's a quickening that comes upon you once the Holy Ghost begins to function in your vessel. Your discernment becomes sharpened. You are careful the kind of things that you do because your life becomes revealed before you. You know that even though all of us look like men, we are not the same. We're not going in the same direction. We are beginning to operate in a dimension that is utterly driven by a supernatural hand. Governed by another spirit. When you know him, then you will begin to love him. Many Christians don't love him. And I'm saying to you is because they don't know him. These men, the reason they came to repentance 
was because Jesus, Peter just took the Jesus, he took the full journey. The one that was prophesied about, you killed him, you buried him, God raised him, and now he's alive. He took them from the written word to the living word. Immediately they saw him. Their hearts desired him. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? A minute their hearts de desired him. You will now see that it was possible for them to obey him. But the Bible now begins to tell us from verse 40. That these ones that were added to the church, what happened? They continued. How? In the apostles. Steadfastly. In the apostles' doctrine. In fellowship. In breaking of bread from house to house. And in prayer. If you know him, you will love him. If you love him, you will obey him. And as you begin to obey him, he will now turn you into a faithful witness. You will begin to proclaim him anywhere you are faithfully. One last scripture. How do I know that I, I know him? First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Give me verse 3. Now by this we know that we what? We know him. How do we know that we know him? If we what? Keep his covenants. So it's not enough to come to church and say I know Jesus. The way we measure those that know him and those that don't know him is that we bring his commandments and we check, are you a perpetual obedient servant? And you know when we are talking about the commandments of God, we are not just talking about the laws of God as revealed in scriptures. We are talking about the commandments he begins to give you when you begin to pray to it in his secret. So he begins to tell you, 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 you are not allowed to do this or do that because of what I want to do with your life. It's not written, written in any chapter or in any book or in any verse of the book. But God is giving you those commandments so that as you obey, you begin to appear like the man had in mind when he factored you into the womb of your parents. He said, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The reason the apostle John uses the word if is because there is capacity for you to choose not to keep his commandments. God will not force you to honor him. He will not force you to obey him. What you can become in the hand of God is heavily dependent on your obedience. And the reason you don't obey him is because you don't know him. The messages that have been preached to you have only shown you what God can give you. It has not shown you Jesus. And you see, the ultimate measure of who a Christian is, is how much of Jesus you look like. That's how we measure the depth of your Christian life. How much of Jesus do you look like? That's how we measure Christians. If you've been born again long enough and you still do not look like Jesus, you don't think like Jesus, you don't act like Jesus, the weight of your Christianity is a fraud. You are fake. That's why we do not teach men to, cl to clone them into our image. True apostolic teaching is to clone men into the image of the Christ. The Christ. The Christ. He said, by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. Next verse. He who says, I know him. And does not keep his commandments. What is he? He's a liar. And the truth is not in him. If you say you know him, you don't keep his commandments, you are a liar. I teach my people, don't become obsessed with public ministry that you abandon your private consecrations. The secret instructions that God gave you, some of you have abandoned the things he told you because you listen to one preacher that asks you, why are you fasting? See, all this fasting, fasting is legalism. Fasting is Old Testament. Jesus, our Jesus said, when they came to ask him, why do the disciples of John fast? Even we, we fast. He said, how do you expect them to fast when the bridegroom is not is around? 
He said, the day is coming when the bridegroom will no longer be around. Then, they will fast. They will fast. In Matthew chapter 5, down to chapter 7, Jesus began to teach us about how kingdom men find expression in the earth. Man of God, begin again, oh, begin again. I'm not finding you. Begin again, begin again. Matthew chapter 5, he begins to teach about the kingdom, the kingdom. And he says, Blessed are they who hunger and test after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Then he begins to go further and further and further. In chapter 6, he now begins to tell them about three critical disciplines of kingdom citizens. He said, you will fast. You will pray. You will give. They are the dis disciplines of kingdom life. That's why me, I don't like teaching about giving. You don't need to teach a genuine child of God about giving. It flows out of your natural life. It's part of your natural proclivities. But because pastors found out that Christians can't deal with their covetousness and greed, we are the ones that made pastors turn into something else. They began to act like thieves. Because left to you, left to you, you will never give. Never give. You are holding for yourself. Oh, me, 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 me. You can see the roof of your church falling. Rain is falling on you. You will shift. You say, Osha, Osha. See your mouth like Osha. You want the pastor to come and stand and say, we need to buy mic. And you see the mic. The mic is not working. We need to buy mic. We need to buy mic. We need to buy mic. And you go home and say, I was not hearing the pastor. Today. What's wrong with the mic in our church? The mic in our church is not working. God. Don't you see churches in Lagos? Meanwhile, every time you come to church, God says, give for the mic. Because he has not dealt with your, your covetousness. Many who should be comfortable are in poverty. Go and look at the standard of the early church. The Bible says in this same chapter, many sold their possessions and brought it such that there was no one amongst them that lacked. No one. If the Bible says no one, no one lacked. The preacher come and say, why are you tithing? Tithing is Old Testament. As you heard it, you say, thank God. Though they won't finish us for church. Now that you have stopped tithing, what have you been given? In this kingdom, we don't give because we are looking for breakthrough. We don't give so that God will give us in return. We give as kingdom citizens. We are in love with our king. Don't you see what happened when they were coming out of Egypt? God led them to spoil the Egyptians. They stripped Egypt naked, left with gold, left with silver. God made sure they didn't need to spend it in the wilderness. Imagine carrying gold you cannot use. Silver you cannot use. Why? Even your shoes were provided for in eternity. Your shoes began to grow. So if you wanted to spend money to buy shoe, God will say you don't need it. That's not why I gave you money. I gave you money to build me a house. The reason he made them spoil Egypt was that he was going to use it to build the tabernacle. It was not for their comfort. Their comfort was already factored in eternity. So their clothes were growing. Manna was falling. Quail was coming. They did not need money for their basic needs. They needed it for kingdom. That's not the original plan. If you've not come to the place, Jesus said, are ye not of more value than they? He said, the fowls of the earth, they neither spin nor store in bands. But your heavenly father, thanks God. Bro, if God gives you a job in Shell, the money is not for your, you and your family. Because even without that money, he can take care of your family. He did it in the wilderness. The money is for the kingdom. But because Satan has planted covetousness, we are in a rat race. We are trying to prove to even sinners that we are successful. Many of us can't go to our school reunion. We are afraid. Class of 1967, when they put everything on WhatsApp, you pretend as if you are not seeing it. Say, Juliet, are you not coming? You will not reply the message until the reunion has finished. Then you come there and lie. You say, ah, I saw the message late. It's a lie. You are ashamed. You don't want to go there and people arrive with their cars. And they say, Juliet, all these holy holies in school, you are still doing holy holy. You are ashamed. Ashamed. So you are in a rat race. 
you want to prove to non so that you are succeeding also that this my god is a good god i was that foolish one time I, I me and my friends i used to go and pray when we finish praying in the morning all of us jobless young men when we finish praying in the morning we now sit down we now say god will bless us one day we say we'll drive our jeep to angu park job then we'll open all the doors i say i will stand on the bonnet like this and i'll be preaching come to this my jesus this my jesus that can bless me i'm sure god was looking at me and saying foolish boy foolish if the gospel on your mouth will be more potent because of material blessing you don't know jesus the message of his death the message of his burial the message of his resurrection and his glorification is enough to turn three thousand men if your life bears that message in reality men you may be very rich in in dollars and pounds men will not be seeing your riches they'll be seeing your jesus they'll be seeing your jesus they'll be seeing your jesus so when he gives us the holy ghost the whole idea of the holy ghost is to begin to reorder our hearts so that we will know the things that are important i don't know the person i need to talk to this afternoon go back bring out your prayer mat and begin again stay with god stay with him stay stay there some of us is the blessing that has crippled us when you didn't have job you were not like this now you have work you're not telling god is the job if he takes it now because he loves you and wants to bring you back you will say he's wicked you are not like this until you enter the relationship and the person you are in relationship with is in another denomination and he says things like what are you praying long for is god lost come on just wake up in the morning and say i receive it Oga. Oh God. Even your Jesus, the Bible, he will arise way before dawn. Hours before Jesus. Oh Jesus, what was Jesus praying about? Sometimes the Bible will say he will spend all night. The, the, the clowns that were with him will be sleeping on. He will pray all night. In the garden of Gethsemane, he came and he wept over them. He said, Kai, so you could not tarry with me. One hour, one. You've been seeing me waking up in the night to go and pray. You've been seeing me waking up early in the morning to go and pray. This one night that I needed you to stand with me in prayer. Just one hour. The Bible says their eyes were heavy with, oh my God. May the day that God comes needing you may not be that day that sleep has crippled you. The day God is saying, I have a maker in Uniport. Then he arrives and he finds out that the maker has become a sleeper. Has become a sleeper because he's listening to the wrong message. Go and check throughout the Acts, throughout the epistles. It was the same message they preached. Paul said, I determined not to know anything amongst you except Christ and him. What? Crucified. It's the same message. But now we are obsessed. Breakthrough. There's nothing wrong with breakthrough if it's the will of God. But you see what I found about Satan. If Satan knows that giving you a job will make you abandon Jesus, he will open a door. So you need to know who opens the doors that you attempt to enter. Did you not hear when he was teaching them how to pray? He said, lead us not into temptation. Do you know the meaning of that prayer, my sister? It means, Lord, if I'm knocking on a wrong door, no matter how much I want what is on the other side, don't open it. That's the meaning of that prayer. Keep the door closed. Don't allow me use my own leg to enter something that will kill me. Keep it closed. Until you deal with my appetite. And you cure me of the loss. Close the door. Close the door. Because if I enter, I can't come out. Some people enter the wrong door. It took them two minutes to enter. It's 25 years now. They are still struggling. They can't come out. He said, lead us not into temptation. But deliver us. So that means if I'm, I'm struggling to enter the door, hold me, Holy Ghost, hold me. There's a song we sing, you worry. It says, mm, just, just like the day of old. Jesus is mine. Sing by. But do not let him go. Do not let him go. Do not let him go. Oh, just like the days of old, Jesus is by sin now. Do 
not let him go. Do not let him go. Do not let him go. Uh, I go hold him. I go hold him. Jesus is passing my way. Jesus is passing my way. I go hold.